Aurelion Mondon, uh, thanks for joining us. So the National Front has been surging in the polls since four years ago. They're now at about 26. What's explaining their increased popularity this time around? It's, it's something that can't be uh, studied, really, uh, in isolation. You have to look at the history of the Front National. The Front National is a, is a very old party. It's 40 years old. Uh, it started in 1972, uh, and it grew uh, very slowly at the beginning. But in 1988 already, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen got 15% of the votes. So, you know, 25%, from 15 to 25% in 28 years uh, is, is not actually that big uh, of, of a leap when you think about it. What's interesting is, as well, uh, to think about this jump uh, with the amount of coverage that the Front National has had recently. And uh, again, you can see that Marine Le Pen has been disproportionately covered. You can mm -hmm. just look at the last uh, two debates, uh, the first one with uh, the main five candidates, uh, where, where she had, a, again, a, a gained a lot of prominence. And, and, and the second one yesterday, where she was the candidate that spoke the longest, and she was also given the last word. So, you know, you can again see that the disproportionate coverage she's getting is very important. So why, why do you think the Front National have been quite so durable, always being at around 15% since the mid-80s? Like that's a, a very long time for a far-right party to be a big player in the game. That's right. I think, I think a, lot of, a lot of it is down to, to, um, to the Front National strategy already. Uh, we tend to think of Marine Le Pen as responsible for the so-called de-diabolisation, the de-demonization of the party. But actually, this started way earlier. Um, it started in the 1980s and, and 90s when some intellectuals on the far right uh, decided to borrow from Antonio Gramsci, the uh, communist, the Italian communist who came up with the concept of hegemony, and they turned it on its head. And these people who uh, were on the kind of sidelines of the far right, not always directly linked to the Front National, but very influential for the Front National, uh, realized that to gain political power, you needed to gain cultural power. And so you couldn't rely on the good old um, biological racist tropes, and you needed to move to uh, other realms. And so they moved to cultural racism instead, which is, you know, we're not superior to you, uh, we're just different. And difference is great, but let's let's keep us apart, right, so that we keep our differences and all our cultures and so on, which obviously sells a lot better. Uh, and particularly in a country like France, where you can hijack some uh, traditionally progressive ideas, such as republicanism or secularism, for example, uh, to kind of um, push for this kind of separation between, uh, between communities. At the end of the day, it is the same uh, racism, really. I mean, it's called new racism, but it is the same. Uh, it's based on exactly the same procedures of racism, which is you just completely generalize a community such as the Muslim people, for example, in France, and say that they are incompatible with our way of life. Concretely, what platform is Le Pen standing on? What, what policies is she advocating? At the moment, she's trying to appeal to very, very different people. The traditional electorate of, of the Front National is a kind of lower middle class electorate of small businessmen, um, artisans, craftsmen, you know, um, uh, shopkeepers and, you know, uh, retired people and so on. And that's, that's the electorate that you find, for example, in the south east of France. That's where the Front National has always been very, very strong. But then the other side of the electorate, and of course I'm simplifying here because there are, there are many nuances in the, in the electorate, but if you want to simplify, then there's the north of France, which is much more kind of old working class uh, areas, which have most, mostly turned to abstention, but also partly the new generations, the younger people have turned to the Front National. Uh, it's the generation, uh, it's, it's people who have never been politicized, if you so the people who used to be part of unions, who used to be part of the Communist Party, uh, who used to be part of these tight-knit communities which were fighting for you know, better work rights and things like that, don't tend to turn to the Front National. It's more the young people who uh, were born after all these kind of big, big kind of labor unionist struggles uh, had passed. Uh, and they were born in, in, in kind of depressed societies with deindustrialization, high unemployment and so on, with no prospects. And so the Front National has to balance between these two very, very different electorates. One of them who wants uh, lower taxes, one of them who wants almost uh, neoliberal policies. And so Marine Le Pen is promising to reduce taxes. She's promising to, uh, yeah, to, to cut kind of a welfare state as well. But at the same time, she's promising to increase the welfare state. And she's promising to kind of give people more money and give people more kind of security and things like that. So it's kind of, it, it's a program that really uh, just pulls in so many different directions that it's just invi inviolable. But it... it it seems to be working at the moment, but for how long? I think that's that's quite interesting. If Le Pen never manages to breach that fifty percent in a second round, or if the National Front never actually come to government, to what extent are we already witnessing a rise in racism in French society, or a rise in the acceptability of that kind of politics 
Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, that's the thing, again, that, that a lot of people tend to forget when they see the Front National losing an election. There tends to be some celebration, for example, in 2002, when uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen lost um, to Jacques Chirac, and Jacques Chirac got 82% in the second round. Everyone celebrated. And I remember, you know, I was, I was 20 at the time. I remember celebrating in the street, uh, you know, and partying. We had defeated fascism and all that. And we hadn't. Fascism had won. And, you know, in 2007, when Jean-Marie Le Pen gets only 10% of the vote and Nicolas Sarkozy kind of siphoned uh, most of his votes, uh, again, people celebrated. And uh, I remember an interview by Marine Le Pen uh, where she's asked, is this the end of the Front National? Is this the end of Jean-Marie Le Pen? And she said, well, I don't think it's the end of the Front National. And in any case, that's the victory of our ideas. And she was totally right. Mm -hmm. You know, Nicolas Sarkozy won and he pummeled the Front National simply by stealing a lot of his rhetoric. Uh, and of course, he couldn't deliver on this rhetoric. But for five years, he kept, you know, making these comments about Islam, against immigration and things like that. And these become normalized. When it's Jean-Marie Le Pen, who is a Holocaust denier, saying these kind of things, it doesn't get into the mainstream. But when it's the French president or the leader of a, of a mainstream party who says these kind of things, then people tend to think it, of it as ac uh, acceptable. You know, it's cognitive liberation in many ways. It's like, oh, hold on. This guy is saying it, therefore, surely I should be able to say it. Um, and you can see that with regard to Islam in France, for example. In, in, it's, it's kind of fascinating in France where you see these Islamophobes going on TV, going, uh, being front page uh, of magazines, publishing books like Eric Zemmour, you know, with, with mainstream publishers, complaining that in France you cannot talk about Islam. And it is true, in France you can't talk about Islam unless you're in front, uh, front page of a magazine, unless you're in primetime TV, unless you're on a very big radio show and things like that. No one talks about Islam except all these people which is completely mad. And so if Marine Le Pen loses uh, in 2017, it will depend how she loses. Uh, and that's what's going to matter, really, because if she gets 20% of the vote in the second round, well, if she loses in the first round already, that's going to be a massive defeat. If she gets to the second round, but gets only, you know, 20, 25% of the vote the same way her father did, that would be a massive defeat for her as well. But if she gets 35%, you know, she will anchor herself as a mainstream candidate, and mm. that becomes very problematic here. And also she will force the debate, you know, that the two weeks after the first round will be played on her cards. Mm.